Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very first ever Next Level Health webinar. My name is Miranda Malasani. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness and Spokesperson at Nature's Emporium and your host for this evening. Education is a core pillar at Nature's Emporium, so we thought let's create a series covering timely topics with incredible experts to help our communities to thrive. There's never been a more important time to discuss mental health. I'm sure all our panelists agree with that. We're all under increased stress and anxiety, so our focus tonight is managing <clears throat> mental health. Stigmas are prevalent and common in our discussion about mental health and males face the added stigma that seeking help or support is a sign of weakness. This couldn't be further from the truth. And as a mom of two boys, I hope that we can have more of these conversations like the ones we're having tonight. And I can definitely speak on behalf of everyone at Nature's Emporium when I say we are honored and grateful to have this power panel of four influential men here with us tonight. And I'm going to introduce them right now. So our first panel member is Brent Bishop. Celebrity fitness trainer, <laughs> published <laughs> author, and expert on City Line. Brent is the founder of Think Fitness Studios in Toronto and has 25 years of experience in the fitness industry. Uh, Brent, last time I think I trained with you, I was sore for seven days. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're somebody who can do 100 push ups in one, in one go. <laughs> and still super so. sore. So much, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, next up, Bryce Wild is a leading functional medicine expert and clinician at P3 Health in Toronto. He's an author of four best selling books, previous host of Wild on Health and CTV, and a regular expert and medical advisor for the Dr. Oz Show. Mm -hmm. Bryce offers an incredible wealth of information in this area, and you're all going to receive a copy of his newest ebook, Brain Spanners. It's amazing. Thank you, Bryce. My pleasure. I won't flex because I'm nowhere near as big as Brent Bishop, right? So it's push-up competitions afterwards, right? <laughs> I, I tend I tend to prefer to flex the brain. Oh, and that, not right. that Brent doesn't have a brain because he does. I was just gonna say, man, it's not a, it's not about size. It's not about size. It's about How performance. It. Yeah. <laughs> so go, go with Brent. <laughs> <laughs> so our third panelist is Peter Neal. Peter is one of the founders of Neal Brothers Foods. And if you've roamed the aisles of Nature's Emporium, and I know you have, uh, you know how much we love Neal Brothers products, myself included. Uh, Peter will be here discussing his personal journey with mental health and how it's inspired him to support mental health initiatives in the community. And last, but certainly not least, we have Kevin Frankish joining us, one of Canada's most watched local TV personalities. Um, Kevin, when I was in journalism school studying my Bachelor of Journalism, I remember watching you on TV and being like, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and so he is now an incredible mental health advocate. He was diagnosed with severe depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder in 2006. You've got, I know Kevin's got an amazing podcast and a live Facebook show called The Happy Molecule. You definitely wanna check out. Um, and so most of us are wearing hoodies. Uh, Kevin missed the memo. Um, you know, we're, we're here to uh, be team mental health. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so we're actually just gonna get started in just a second, just a few housekeeping details uh, for you watching at home, grab a pen a paper, your tea, your water. I've got mine here. Maybe you want to have a, a non-alcoholic lager from Neil Brothers. Maybe. There you go. Um, and I always like to set the intention at the beginning of a conversation like this. Uh, keep your heart as open as your mind throughout. I think just like kindness has a ripple-like effect, so does sharing our own personal challenges. So you just never know who you're going to help in the future by sharing the information you learn from our team tonight. Um, and so now, gentlemen, I have something to say to you as well before we get started. You're all uh, amazing. You have so much to say. You're TV experts, but you know we need to share the air. So we have we have paddles here with your faces on them. And so when I hold up, and you're all here, this is a little hard to see. See, you see here? Yeah. So when I hold up the paddle and it's red, it means like I'm gonna wrap it up in maybe 20 or 30 seconds or so. And when Why are you holding around, mine to show this? What did you say, Kevin? So why are you holding mine to <laughs> show this in, in case you talk longer? Let's Hold up the red one. Go. <laughs> so if it's a red, it means like we're moving on to another question. If it's a green, I see you, you know, in this technological movement of the flow conversation, it means I see you and you're up next to answer and chime in. So there we go. Um, it's time to get started. Uh, let, let's start with Kevin. Kevin, if you don't mind jumping in first and talking about your personal journey so far with mental health, then we'll start from there. Um, can, by the way, can I have Brent's paddle when you're done with it? Just, yeah, absolutely. Okay, just yeah. asking for a Parting friend. gift. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it goes back to 2006 when I had a, um, an incident on the air, which I, and I call it that because I didn't know what it was. And it turns out it was a panic attack. 
And um, it scared the hell out of me. I literally left the show in the middle of the show and I, I went home crying. I honestly drove all the way home crying. I thought that was it. That's the end of my career. I'm never going to be able to. I honestly had the feeling I could not go back on television again. Um, one of the first people I turned to was Bryce Wilde. And, uh, you know, we can chat about that uh, later on. But, um, you know, so all in all, you know, by and by, we started to learn what it was. I started to cope with it. Uh, it was tough for many years. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder and severe depressive disorder. But then, you know, I learned what it was to live with depression rather than suffer from depression. So I, I came to terms with that. So I've been a mental health advocate ever since. I, I like to speak out about mental health. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we're finally starting to recognize it. Uh, as being important. I've watched it over the last uh, the last several years and it, it's gained in importance. So I now run a platform called The Happy Molecule. So that's a podcast. It's a website. It is a, uh, a blog. It is a Facebook live show on Sunday evenings. So it's all about getting good advice and positivity out to everyone about mental health. And when it comes to mental health, this concerns everyone we all have mental health. Just like we all have physical health, we all have mental health. You know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, Brent is only going to talk to people who exercise. No, Brent needs to talk to everybody because everybody needs to exercise. So we all have mental health. We all have a stake in this. Things are really bad right now with the, uh, the pandemic. We're going into what's called the echo pandemic. Experts are calling it that. That is uh, the severe depression that people are now experiencing and even mild depression as a result of isolation and loneliness and uncertainty. So uh, it, it um, yeah, it's a journey. It's, it's quite a journey. So you mentioned to me before that it's so important to recognize the signs of loneliness. So maybe mm -hmm. we can talk a bit more about that and, and how sometimes we have the shame when we're talking about loneliness. Well, you know what, if you're lonely, you're a loser, right? Like that's the feeling we're, we're given. Um, no, no, that's not it. You know, it may not be, it's, it may not be through your own fault that you're, you're lonely or you're alone. You can be lonely by the way, in a relationship, you can be lonely in a stadium full of people. So loneliness is very bad for your health. Uh, a study that was done several years ago uh, showed that loneliness has the equivalent effect on your physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So think about that, smoke 15 cigarettes a day or be lonely. It's the same thing for your health. And the reason we, we say that, and I know Bryce can, can answer this a little bit better than I can, is loneliness affects so much of, of your, your body. So it, can, it affects your heart, it affects your breathing, it affects, it, it affects everything. And people die of loneliness. So you're 26% more likely to have a premature death if you're lonely. Actually, and, we, we've spoken about this on your podcast, just real quick. Yeah. You've yeah. spoken about this on your podcast before, and the centenarians, the people that live beyond 100 around the world, whether you're in Sardinia or you're in uh, the Himalayan mountains or you're in Loma Linda, California, or you know, per perhaps you're in uh, Okinawa in Japan, um, they all revere uh, this idea that the Japanese actually call ikigai or sense of purpose. So I'm flipping this to the other side, by the way, versus looking at the negative you know, contribution of st the, the stress of being lonely because we're, we're social beings. Uh, but the flip side is when we have a sense of purpose, we're not lonely because we're with our family, our friends. And, and this is what the Japanese do. They have sibling rivalry around caring for their elders in their home units versus kicking them to the curbside or into an old age home or a retirement home. Their sense of purpose there is now I'm still a contributing member of society. And so that's unlonely and the chances of being depressed as you absolutely very eloquently described as being equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day is because that level of oxidative stress from smoking is equivalent to the stress of being lonely from cortisol and adrenal overproductivity because you can't find your sense of purpose so 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 well said and so when we hear about people especially in old age homes um we don't it's not they don't put it on the death certificate they died of loneliness but quite often that is the mitigating factor. 
Um, so let's go back a bit. That's such great information to share to the panic attack part, Kevin. Um, yeah. I just want to say, and I mentioned this to you before, that your sharing of your panic attack on live TV helped me so much too, because I myself did years of live TV and had panic attacks that I hid and was very scared to deal with myself and also tell anybody else. So when you shared that, it was such a tremendous thing for me and I know so many people. And so why don't we go down and talk more about panic attacks and the steps in dealing with it and what to expect and to understand because it is a, it is a you know um, physiological process that we go through and we have to understand what that what that looks like. And Bryce, you, you chime in too. Okay, it, it, it's difficult because it's so difficult to describe. In fact, quite often when uh, you know an emergency room doctor once told me, he, he said, when someone comes in and I ask what's wrong, um, and they say, I don't know. That's a pretty good chance that that person has had some sort of anxiety attack. Um, and so it, it's difficult, you know, people describe it different ways. One of the most common ways, it feels like a heart attack. It feels like you're going to die. Uh, you're sure you're going to die. Like this, this, it's doom, it's doom right away. And the best advice I got was years ago, someone had said, I don't know, remember where I heard this from? They said, I beat panic attacks because I stood up to it. And I thought about it and thought about it. And I said, well, yeah. I mean, the panic attack is probably going to come, right? Unless, you know, you try and do what you can to bring your stress levels down, bring your anxiety down. But if a panic attack starts, it's coming. It is coming. So you have two choices. You can fight it or you can just let it happen. And I remember when I was when I was a teenager, I was in Air Cadets, and we would go up in in a glider, and I kind of was very nervous about this. Like we're in a plane without an engine here, so I remember when the glider would would you know bank left, I would bank right. When the glider would bank right, I would bank left, and the pilot said, you know, I can because he was in front of me. He said, I can feel you back there because every move you make, I can feel in the glider and you're making it really difficult for me to control. Do me a favor, please just go with the glider. You've got no choice anyway. And so what I did was, was then, oh, okay. And I felt like, oh, really stupid. But, but when the glider banked left, I, I would bank left. And then I just sort of became one with the glider. And I felt when I was right, I was really enjoying myself all of a sudden because I wasn't fighting it. So when an anxiety attack or a panic attack happens, it's similar to, to water going through a garden hose. If, if you turn on the water and then you grab that garden hose and try and squeeze it and stop all the water from coming out, well, you know, as long as the water stays on, it's, it's not gonna, it's gonna come out one way or the other eventually. And when it comes out, it is gonna come out fast and it's, it, you know, it, it could hurt if your hand was in front of it. So the best thing to do is just allow it to flow it can't hurt you and it can't kill you. Although it tries to convince your mind it's going to, it can't. And once you realize that, it's something like having a sneeze. Imagine, mm -hmm. imagine if you would, that, that you have never sneezed your entire life. You never knew what a sneeze was. Nobody in the world had ever sneezed and you sneeze. That would scare you to death. Absolutely. Because a sneeze is a violent action, but we've just come to accept it. Now we just turn our head and, 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 and we sneeze. But if you didn't know what it was, you would honestly think you were dying in, instead. And the worst thing to do is fight a sneeze, right? Absolutely. So allowing it to happen, you know, you do your best to try to prevent it from happening. But once it starts happening, the best thing to do is stand your ground and let it pass, it will. The other, the other one good piece of advice, tell someone. Mm -hmm. I would tell people when I'm having one, I don't have them very much anymore. When I'm having one, I would say, I'm having a panic attack. And they'd always be surprised, but it took a bit of the weight off my shoulders, right? It's incredible. It makes me think of the saying, you have to feel it to heal it. Because mm -hmm. you really have to become, you know, move into it. I think that's such a great share. Thank you so much, Kevin. For sharing. Uh, and I, and I got to say, I love those parallels and analogies, Kev. They're going to stick with me forever now. And I'm going to use them as tools to explain um, my appreciation uh, to my patients. Because the one thing I can say is, thankfully, uh, you know, 
I have the blessing of, of never having experienced depression. And I say that because I at least understand and I've seen a lot of patients and empathize with it, but that's all I can do. I can't say that I know what depression is. But to Miranda's earlier point, I can say that I've had some on-air anxiety. Kevin was there when I had my first panic attack. So I've definitely had that. Um, but I wanted to just suggest our brains, just real quick, our brains have evolved to accept that negative outcome because it's survivalistic is much, much more important to be aware of. Whether we understand something or not, or our spidey senses say something is stressful and we should flight or fight as we call it. And, and that oversurge, and we'll maybe talk about this later and certainly some solutions for it, that oversurge of the adrenal glands, the, the, the adrenaline, noradrenaline and cortisol is ultimately what drives the brain to think there is something worthy of running from fast. And if you can't identify that fear, you have panic because you ultimately, as Kevin was saying, you don't really know like that sneeze is the, the sneeze and you don't even know what that means. And so and, and anyways, Kev, well said, and, and we'll get into maybe the nitty gritty of how the brain works uh, a little bit later. Were you afraid, Bryce, that I was going to bring out the paddle there? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that's great advice. Thank you so much, Kevin. And we're going to move on to Peter. Um, I had the opportunity to, to talk with you a couple weeks ago, Peter and hear a bit about what you've been through. And maybe you can also introduce, you know, your story and uh, the challenges that you faced. Yeah, and I'd like to say, again, big thanks to Nature's Important. Thanks to you. Um, thanks to everybody out there listening. You know, it's, uh, it's not a topic that uh, is exciting and happy and fun to talk about, but it certainly is one that is incredibly important and certainly, you know, highlighted through what we're going through. So right now with this pandemic um, and, uh, yeah, I'll just quickly say, you know, 33 years of, of business with my brother um, and I got to age of 52 or so and had never had anything like a panic attack. I'd never had, I had low mood at times, um, maybe a breakup of a girlfriend or something, you know, but mild stuff, right? Or, or wondering where our business was going to go when we were making five or 6,000 on our T4s a year. After a few years of being married, those were, weren't fun years, but you know, for the most part, I was always hashtag happy PD. You know, you know, my wife would say uh, rainbows and unicorns. Um, and then in, in 2019, in the spring, um, I'd been going pretty hard. We'd set up a, a deal with a cannabis company. We had tried to launch a, an alcoholic product. And then something incredibly tragic happened. Um, one of our good friends uh, succumbed to mental health. Um, and it was incredibly traumatic for our um, their family for our family. And I remember sitting in the, uh, in the funeral um, thinking, and as I've thought about people like Anthony Burden in the past, you know, um, how could anyone get so low? How could anyone, you know, think that the only way out was to um, uh, end their life? And it didn't make any sense to me, like if Bryce is saying, you know, and it doesn't until you've been in it. Um, <clears throat> suddenly, at the end of um, the summer, August 2019, I started to feel really down. And by the second week of September, I was into full-fledged uh, depression. And I had no idea what it meant. Um, I think there was a, a whole lot of anxiety and, and a bit of a breakdown. Um, we had a daughter who'd been in, in, in all sorts of different mental health care for years. She'd just been coming back from a two-year program in, uh, at a, at a live-in institution for help. And that wasn't looking good to me for her coming home. And she was coming home within months. Uh, the cannabis thing didn't go well. I was running from, you know, plane to plane, from city to city. And I remember people, my wife saying, you know, how do you keep doing it? How does your husband keep doing it? Like, he's just like Superman. And I thought I was super, I thought I was invincible. In fact, I had that conversation with my therapist yesterday. Um, but, you know, I think what happened is I had really plugged in far too many things into the into the grid um and i it just couldn't handle it anymore so the uh the panel shut down or the, the fuse is blue and <clears throat> by the end of i guess by the end of september 2019 um uh you know i didn't know which way was up and life had gone dark um and you know i became i was suicidal for two weeks um uh, i got to the point of you know um two or three different uh, plans that kept me up all night long as to how I would end my life. And it didn't make any sense to, to my friends, uh, didn't make any sense to my family. And it was uh, the most, the scariest thing I've ever been through in my life. I just did not, nothing made sense to me. I was completely delusional, sleep deprived. I was lost 25 pounds in about two and a half weeks. Um, so fortunately I, I got some help through my doctor. Then that led to some therapy. I never thought I'd ever, 
you know, seek therapy. That just didn't make any sense to me. Uh, I understood it and, and didn't judge people for it, but I didn't understand how that would ever work for me. Um, so a number of things, fortunately, you know, um, uh, helped out. I, I was able to reach out and get some supports. Um, and, you know, I started walking with my friend who had, who had lost his wife and the two of us started walking every single day and we allowed each other to call each other. Didn't matter what time of night. Sometimes we went for a walk at one o'clock in, in the morning. Uh, you can imagine through the end of March with the pandemic, there's no one on Young Street. We have these long walks. Going, this, this is crazy. Um, but we helped each other. We healed each other, you know, and we were there for each other no matter what. Um, and what the, what's amazing is we've, we've created a business that we're launching in a couple of months that supports all of that. It, it supports men's mental health and it's all through a pair of underwear. So uh, the strangest ideas or the strangest um, things I think can happen when, when you're out walking, connecting, sharing, and through that sharing their strength. And it was my strength and, and it helped my friend and the two of us are in a much better place, thank goodness, today. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have comments and questions coming in on the side and someone just said, Lorianne said, um, thank you for being so brave and sharing this with us. I appreciate you. And it does take um, that strength and being brave to share the story and what you went through. Um, so maybe the next question could be, um, how, what would you say to family members, loved ones that are supporting someone going through such a, a challenging time? What, what would you say to them? I would, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And, you know, I liken it to, um, you know, someone sitting at a table choking, um, you know, uh, you ask them if they're okay and, and they're embarrassed and they run up to the washroom and die. And that happens. Um, it, it don't take, I'm okay for, for, for an answer. If, if you're seeing signs um, that, that you know, whether you Google and look for signs or you have an idea of what, um, you know, severe mental health and depression can look like. Um, don't say, don't, don't, don't take no for an answer. Um, for me, it was getting to a GP. It was ensuring that um, I could sleep at night. It was ensuring that I could get nourishment, although I could hardly eat anything. My mom was driving down from Aurora down to Leaside where we live uh, every day, you know, usually in tears and trying to bring some nourishment and food and just not understanding what was wrong with her son. I'd gone vac vacant. And um, Charlene Kelly is one of the people I'm, I'm listening right now. Uh, who's a dear friend and, and she was one of my many angels. So she took care of my wife and I, but you know, that idea of support and allowing it, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to um, see it. It's hard to accept it. I had my head down low the odd time I'd go out and, and walk the dog just to, cause I thought I had to. Um, and, and, and those around me didn't stop to, to ensure that I was in to see my doctor to ensure that I'd help find me a therapist to ensure I was taking the medication eventually and eating properly. So yeah, don't, um, and don't, don't stop if, if, if CAMH isn't the right answer at that point in time or your local hospital, because I went through that. And um, I think if I had continually been taken into a hospital for that reason, um, I don't know where I would have ended up. My friend's wife, um, I won't name the hospital, but a local hospital, um, was the opposite of help, um, sadly. And uh, at one point in time, she said, you take me back there and that's, that's, that, that'll be the end. Um, and, you know, so don't give up. Look for any opportunity to, to, to be there, to hug, to listen, to help um, in, a, in a really meaningful way. And, and door one at hospital X doesn't work. Try door number two, door, don't stop finding help it, you you wouldn't stop if someone says i think the cancer's gone away you know um you know you'd look for the best doctor wouldn't you and you'd be open you'd be sharing you'd asking your friends how do i help this person and yeah. and that's again you know inherently the, one of the problems with mental health is there's shame to it we don't want to talk about it to a lot of people so yeah um i think that's part of the problem is because we we try it we're so try to be kind to others and we don't want to step over boundaries. But in so sometimes with our loved ones, we do have to do that because like you said, uh, you're sick and you don't know what to do at that point. Um, so it is, it is a huge challenge. So thank you for that advice. I do have a couple of things on the side here, a couple of comments and questions. Um, Jody Walker, uh, shout out to my old high school friend, Peter, you're an inspiration. You take in your story and created incredible meaning and hope for others. Love Jody. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you are currently nourishing your, your mental health right now on a day-to-day -day basis. How are you doing that? You know, I started by, you know, uh, cutting the alcohol. Um, that's when I launched our 
the alcohol is beer, but I stopped uh, drinking alcohol. Um, and, and then I started drinking again during COVID. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I got to a point again, you know, in the last six or seven months where I was just concerned, I could see some of the signs and I was aware of it. I talked to my therapist. I talked to the people that I had entrusted my, my mental health to um, as part of my support group and uh, made a decision to do something. They, if, if I'd known Brent at the time, I, I would have called Brent. Uh, but we, I found an oper- a place that replaced um, uh, my gym. So I, need, I knew I needed some physical uh, activity. I knew I needed to cut the booze. Um, so I've been, what, six weeks, I guess now, and it feels amazing um, doing a nutritional style keto with a, with a specialist who was really helping us on food. Um, and and, and you know, getting out, I, I walk every day. So my, my friend, Paul, who we're starting this underwear business with has, has found someone else to walk with on a more regular basis. And so I walk with someone different just about every day. I would say four or five days a week for an hour. I do the workout in the morning. I eat um, um, uh, and eat well and, and healthy. And uh, it has been amazing for me. So I'm, I'm back to an energy level and an outlook on life that I haven't had in probably two and a half years. It's taken that long. Well, you're looking awesome. I have to say the, yeah, results. Amazing. Well done. And uh, 25 pounds in the last awesome. six weeks. So yeah, that's incredible. So, yeah. Um, I bet you feel really good too. Like the energy, like you said, that's a really great momentum. Um, so my last question for you is, um, more of a comment question. So our staff in Nature's Emporium, you know, they are working on overdrive. They're essential workers, um, as a community. Cause I know you're really big into supporting community mental health initiatives. You know, as a community, how can we best support each other better um, when we're past, we're pushed past our limits? I think that's the problem right now is we're all kind of pushed past our limits and the essential workers are pushed past even those limits. So what can we do to support them better? Yeah, I think w- whether you're a customer in the store or whether you are part of the management or you're a fellow employee or you're seeing someone in the neighborhood that, uh, or a friend, um, you know, you, you, you need to do you need to ask them that question. You do need to check in with them and you need to look in the eye and ask them how they're doing. How are you doing? You know, it used to be my, how are you doing was just like anyone else. How's it going? And you wouldn't really listen. Someone could say, I've got cancer. I'm dying. Oh, great. Um, but I think you really need to listen. You really need to, to um, ask them, is there anything you can do to help? Would you like to go for a walk? Is there anything I can do to help at work? You know, we've had a couple of folks um, uh, and we've said, and, and, you know, we were hit hard too. So we cut our, our company in half at Neil Brothers and we, in March and, and um, you know, we have team A and team B. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had no break. So, but team A has been stressed, you know, a lot of pantry loading. Uh, it's not just snacks and chips that we do. We do all sorts of products that are actually, you know, that are essentials to a natural food store but essentials to a lot of stores and and we got hit hard so suddenly we had a small group of people getting hit hard and people stressed about coming into work and you know hourly employees from our warehouse who um were really nervous um some of them struggling with a with second language and so you know for us it was you know uh, stay at home if you need to we'll pay um it was you know if you're scared we'll, we'll uber you for a while until things kind of got to normal by may um, and we just worked in whatever we could to, to do what we usually try to do. Uh, my brother and I um, is provide, uh, you know, a respectful, trustful, engaging community. Um, and you spend more time at work with your fellow colleagues than you do with your family. So it damn well better be a decent place to be. And, you know, we've been talking about that with, with um, paid sick days recently. And, and there is a, a net benefit, 100%, that creates loyalty and creates place where people want to work right so it's it's so it's asking how how are you doing what can i do for you um and doing it in a meaningful way and and looking for the opportunity to to really find an answer to help them if they're struggling yeah bringing that true sense of connection i think sometimes we we say hi how are you and it's like a very common that's what we say but what about that true like how are you for miranda and hugging without hugging (laughs) hugging without hugging yeah Miranda, could I, I just wanted to add to that, yeah. uh, talking to people, because there's other, other people wondering about, about how, how do you keep going on? Uh, because, you know, it, it's one thing to get a positive attitude and, and to, to overcome something, but, you know, you keep getting knocked down and how many times can you pick yourself back up again? So talk is so important. One of the most important phrases that you can remember is you are not alone. You know, it, quite often when we get 
depressed and down about something, we feel victimized. We feel, ah, why is the world picking on me? Why is it just me? But by having talk, and I, I teach, um, I teach journalism. Uh, I, I have a class on Fridays at Seneca, um, and I spend the first half hour of my lecture talking with the students. I want to know how you feel. And I go through every single one of them. And if you just feel like saying, okay, that's fine. But we all, none of them do. They, they, they all just, they let, it, they let it out. So reminding people they're not alone. The world has not faced something like this. This kind of lockdown, this kind of isolation since World War II. Not in, in, in any of our lifetimes have we faced something like it? So this is new, this is different. There's no rule book. And, 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 and we, you know, we, we are always a society, we're always, a, a, you know, a society that, that wants answers. Well, you know what? We don't know how long this is gonna last. We didn't, you know, we don't know what isolation is really doing. We don't know what's gonna happen to the economy. And that uncertainty, you know, makes you feel victimized. So talk and listen and talk and listen and talk. It, it's the best thing to do right now. Now there are also, by the way, especially if we're people in Ontario, there's free online digital therapy. And there are many, 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 many sources. I was doing an interview with Morno Chappelle earlier on today. And um, it, theirs is myicbt.com. My with an I, cbt.com. Um, but there are many. I know uh, there's a very good one. Uh, Beacon Health does, does one, Mind Beacon, I should say. Is that what you have, Peter? Yeah, and Kevin, I was I was looking for this because I saw Wiki uh, Wiki Vice, Vicky Weiss, sorry, Vicky, sweet old <laughs> pal, and uh, um, you know, uh, this was sent to me by um, my I hate to call her our, our lawyer because she's like a best friend, like a sister, but anyway, she is an amazing girl, and she has been doing CBT through through this as well through Mind Beacon, um, uh, Kevin. So it's I, I've just started in on it tonight. So ah, oh, good, yeah, yeah, and it's free. That's amazing. So much information. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move over to Bryce. Uh, um, and the only question I'm going to start with Bryce is what have you done for your brain today? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, well, first of all, uh, you know, today I've already had my sauna. I've had my cold co uh, contrast dunk. Um, I have eaten my eight servings of uh, brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Uh, of which I believe for the brain is imperative. Before I go on with my laundry list and my typical rhetoric as it pertains to brain health, by the way, because this is how I frame it up. This is my area of expertise. This is my sort of scope in context of mental health. I want to really give Peter and Kevin uber kudos, right, for not just opening up their own stories and sharing. Um, and I alluded to earlier that I personally, myself in this body, have not had uh, experience with, you know, severe mental disease or, or depression. But I come from a family where my father had bipolar, two of my uncles had schizophrenia, one of my cousins, first cousins committed suicide, um, two of my, and it, and it gets, you know, broader. So mental health riddles my family. Um, and so I'm actually kind of lucky that I never had a, an issue and, and continue not to have an issue. But my mind, my brain, my logic is always on the alert, doing everything that I can possibly do. So to your point, Miranda, shameless plug, I just wrote the book. And this is the question I've had for everyone else. Uh, what have you done for your brain today? And of course, we're Brain spanners is a playoff on health span, which is not just how long you live on this planet, which is lifespan. Brain span is how long you live with the most optimal brain possible. And that includes mental health and wellness. One of my interviews was Brent Bishop because his whole idea, and you hear this for him momentarily, is think fitness. It's not just how you work out and build stronger muscles and body. You have to live it, breathe it, and think it. And when we have mental disease or we have our mental health is skewed, it's very hard to just tell somebody think better or think well or be positive as Kevin and Peter you've just heard from it here's what I've learned not from school but directly from my patients what not to say and Peter Kevin please weigh in because you guys are the inherent experts you've lived it but I've, I've learned this just remember advice is not the same for as asking for help if somebody asks for your advice give it if you so choose 
but don't offer them helpful solutions or statements that seem like a cure for their depression, because this ultimately can feel very judgmental or even non-empathetic. So my patients have come back to me over the years and said, and, and they've said, don't say to me, just think happy thoughts or just meditate or just get your act together or just eat well. I don't understand what you have to be so sad about. Everything will be okay, I promise. I cut out sugar and I was cured. You know, you should try that. Uh, or you just need to snap out of this or perhaps even so many people out there are worse off than you. Those are my top lists of things not to say. And I've learned that from my patients over the years. And I just wanted to share that. Peter, Kevin, agree? Oh, to <laughs> totally agree. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, no, 100%. You know, um, and it's for funny because I, I, my, I live with my wife and three daughters and um, my wife would always say, Peter, just listen. I said, well, I am listening, but I'm, you know, I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to save you too. You know, it's like, don't stop rescuing, stop trying to help, mm -hmm. just listen. Uh, and that has been a very difficult, fortunately I was learning that through Pine River, this institute where my daughter was, um, and I was a bit ready for that. But yeah, I, I did have a number of people saying, um, oh, you know, things are gonna turn around, it'll be okay, it'll be good. All I wanna do is, I didn't have any energy, but I just really, I really wanted to strike them. <laughs> So, I mean, I understood where they're coming from, but it, it, it wasn't, certainly wasn't helpful. And I'll say another thing that was, was I found very challenging afterward is, um, and it was a family member um, and no judgment against them. But, you know, I said, um, I, I'm being asked to speak about something or I've, I've posted something on social um, in, in an effort to hopefully reach out to someone who may think, wow, he's got it all together. Um, and yet he, 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 he got very sick, not weak. He wasn't, it was the whole commentary, right? Not, not weak, but I was sick, I was ill. And this person said, well, what's next? You're gonna take a billboard out and tell everybody too? And what's that gonna do for your business and your life and everything else? You look like some weak ass. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't need that judgment right now. And that's the antithesis of what we need to do, right? We need to talk, we need to share, we need to, to so yeah. Uh, I, I apologize if I took it in a bit of a different direction there, Bryce, but I'm sure Kevin's got some similar thoughts. <laughs> well, there is a video that was posted years ago on YouTube. A funny, funny video. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It's called, It's Not About the Nail. And essentially, it boils down exactly what is wrong between husbands and wives. And that is exactly as Peter said, is that husbands, by our nature, want to solve things. So it, it, it's, you know, here's, here's a tip for newlyweds. If your wife says to you, um, I've got a headache, don't say, I'll be right back with a Tylenol. She wants you to say, how come? How does it feel? How did you get it? Just a little bit of a lesson for you. And it's the same thing when it comes to mental health. Listening is important. So remember the terms, what's going on? What did that feel like? What, what, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm here. I'm here. Uh, the, the, earlier there was someone, what can you do for someone who was, uh, I want to I go back and just see the exact wording of that. Uh, I just have to say, Kevin, I hear you as a woman on this uh, all male <laughs> panel. And I think this is such great information because it's you're, you're holding space and you're showing ultimate empathy. You're not trying to fix it. You're just standing there supporting them. And I think in the words you use is everything when you're on this, because when you have that support system and you are standing there and just being empathetic, it is that energy that comes through that is everything. Right? Well, not yeah. And so it's not about the nail. Please look it up on YouTube. This one question, how can you help a loved one that is silent with their pain, long silences, not answering the phone, et cetera? You know what? Um, you, you, can, you can only do what you can do. You, you do your best. Don't give up. And I know Peter said that too. It's so important. Because you know what? Just as frustrated as you might be, with someone else, they're 10 times more frustrated with it. They want it to end. They don't know what to do. And you know what? They may get mad at you. They may ignore you. So the best thing you can do in that case is just say, I'm here. That's it. And like you said, you're not alone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm uh, not going to leave you alone. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's so brilliant. And the reason why um, everyone who's joining with us uh, tonight, and thanks so much for joining us and, and chatting with your comments, please submit your questions because we'll get to your questions by the end if we haven't already. The reason why um, the Center for Loss um, PDF, uh, which is ultimately called the Mourner's Bill of Rights. This is something that's so helpful I found over the years with my patients as it pertains to having a loss of a loved one. Now, that in and of itself can actually throw somebody into depression and, and, and mental disease. It could be like the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. But the reason I'm, I'm sharing this is if all you do, and I think this will resonate a lot with folks uh, out there suffering from uh, mental health issues, if all you do is replace in this document, in this PDF, grief with depression, it speaks volumes. So for example, it's describing that you have the right as an individual uh, to experience and suffer from depression, but you have the right to experience your own unique depression. You have the right to talk about your depression. You have the right to feel a multitude of emotions around your depression, like confusion and disorientation and fear and guilt and all these different things. And the conversation around it has to be had with your family, your friends, your trusted uh, you know, healthcare providers. But just take a peek at that. And I believe strongly, if you replace grief with depression, uh, it will resonate. And, and no one's written the document on this. I think a psychiatrist or somebody uh, with this level of expertise um, you know, has the wherewithal, it should be written. Now, listen, I'm the kind of guy that's going to ultimately get a lot of uh, red paddle from Miranda because I have so much to share. I'm going to really try to keep it tight. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, the reason why I asked this as a subtitle, what have you done for your brain today, is because <clears throat> we all know we should be exercising for our heart. I'm not taking anything away from you, Brent, but I, we all know that we should be monitoring our blood work for cholesterol. We all know uh, that we want to keep a trim waistline. We all know what we're doing uh, perhaps for our liver by reducing the amount of alcohol we're consuming. So we know what these different organs are and what they generally do and how to keep our finger on the pulse. But why aren't we thinking about our most important organ at all times? Because I'll tell you something, if you eat right, sleep right, um, but, you know, believe right and breathe right and exercise right for your brain, you're serving every other organ in your body. So what have you done for your brain today? And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to belittle the idea that depression is somehow no more than the brain, the organic material of neurotransmitters and nerve cells in the brain. It's more than that. It's spiritual. It's emotional. It's things we don't even know about the brain. But at the end of the day, my focus is ultimately, you know, how can natural health, how can natural medicine impart uh, a healthier, more optimized brain neurochemistry. So many years ago, I've been in pr clinical practice for those that don't know me uh, for over 20 years now. And I've always been a huge advocate, actually for the last 10 years, it didn't exist before that, of understanding the human genome. This is your genetics. So looking at something we refer to as, um, you know, uh, uh, as executive function. So how do we, what's our default network? Well, how do we sort of default in the face of stress or emotions? Or what's our predisposition uh, to depression and anxiety in the beginning or, or, or to begin with? you know, out of, out of mom's womb. So it turns out there's like five really important genes, one for adrenaline, one for dopamine, which is, by the way, the happy molecule, Kevin's uh, podcast, don't forget about that one, the dopamine uh, connection, it's huge. Um, uh, you know, adrenaline, I think I said that, serotonin, but my focus is around heavily, is around something called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF. So all of these matter together, our genetic predisposition to making more of this stuff. Some of us make a lot, some don't make enough. What can we do to boost this? But first of all, what is it? So what this is, as we've learned now, more recent science has shown us that it's not true that after the you know, you know, right, you know, young age of about 13 or 14, that our brains stop making new nerve cell connections and making new nerve cells to begin with in the brain. Our brains are forever throughout our lives neuroplastic. So it's important to understand that these nerve cells disconnect and reconnect. That's so huge for depression. I'll circle back on that momentarily. But also that something called neurogenesis, making new nerve cells is possible. And when we can do both of these things in the healthiest way possible, we have the healthiest brain. And when we have the healthiest brain, we ultimately, it, it transposes to, translates to a healthier mood, no matter what your predisposition. So here's, it, here's the bottom line. I want everyone to remember this one thing, if nothing else from me. You can't change your genes. They're there. That's like the cards that mom and dad have dealt you. Now you're playing those cards in this game of life. You can, however, 
modify your genetic expression. I'm going to say that again. You can't change your DNA, but you can modify how your DNA expresses through diet, lifestyle, exercise, and in many cases, supplementation. So how do we boost more BDNF? You know you have low BDNF if ultimately you're a sun worshiper and you feel incredibly well after exercise, which Brent will talk to you momentarily. So BDNF, brain drive, it's a mood stimulating hormone for, for increasing and enhancing mood. And it's also, again, that neuroplastic, so that brain that's more able to reconnect and disconnect. Disconnecting is just as important as connecting. So when we learn a bad behavior or we learn that we're for, perhaps in this default mode network, so one of the questions that we had uh, it, you know, a, a little bit earlier on, Bryce, can you explain what happens to your brain when it suffered multiple emotional psychological traumas? This is part, of, part and parcel. So going back to what I said even earlier, where your brain by default wants to really galvanize and solidify the idea that this one negative event is more likely to happen than the five or 10 other positive events. And that's survivalistic. So that neural connection is, is, is easier to be had by the brain because it supposedly saves your life than the positive events, the happy times, right? So BDNF allows for a disconnect your brain's ability to disconnect from the belief that that negative event somehow outweighs the positive events. So boosting BDNF is key. So here's another way. So um, coffee bean extract, not the actual bean, the mesocarp, in fact, of the coffee fruit is something that directly boosts BDNF. You heard me mention vitamin D, the Council of Responsible uh, Nutrition suggests 4,000 IU. Uh, vitamin D every day during this COVID time, because it so happens to be that it actually prevents uh, you know, viral replication and you getting COVID in the first place and other viruses. And north of 40, where we all live, we're not getting enough vitamin D. I say, talk to your doctor about getting a test 25 OHD blood work. It's simple to do, a little harder to get to these days, but nonetheless, everyone can do 4,000 IU a day, probably more. When you're outside, full sun exposure, you know, in a bathing suit in the sun in the summer, your body is converting in 10 minutes about 15,000 IU a day. So the safety factor, you know, do your own due diligence, but take more vitamin D for sure. Now, I actually have some top favorites of, you know, consumer facing brands. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so, I don't care so much about the brands as much as I do about the ingredients found within these brands. Well, Bryce, can, I, can I pop up one too that I love very much? Uh, that you know what? And none of this, and none of this has been planned. I promise you on oh, my- no, come on. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Okay, so talking about ingredients, I'm not sure if this is going to show up, but, but look at this. So look, so it's so important to know what, where your ingredient sources yeah. is. Do you, see, do you see that there? Theanine. Now the source you can see is from a proprietary sun theanine. Part of what I do, I wear a lot of hats, but besides being a clinician, I travel the globe. I do due diligence on these ingredients that the suppliers, the manufacturers that supply the consumer facing brands. So, so I walk into these manufacturing centers and I actually review what they're doing and their science. And I've been to Tayo in Japan and I know what they're doing with sun theanine. They've got over 70 human clinical trials behind them that improves focus, attention, alertness, concentration, um, mood, and they're a better sleep. All of those things. This is an amino acid. And it's got to be sun theanine, not other forms of L-theanine. They're typically nothing against China or what's coming out of China. Well, I'll reserve that for another conversation. But anyway, the idea is that sun theanine is the one to look at 100 to 200 milligrams twice daily. And even five, a handful of clinical trials for safety, efficacy in children showed ADHD was managed right? And there's no conflict if you're taking an ADHD medication because it also improved their sleep. So attention, focus, alertness, concentration, and mood, and then sleep at night. And it's an amino acid. So th th this is, you know, this is, so this is natural factors. This is found at Nature's Emporium. Yeah. And I have to say, Bryce, that this is something that I have myself been taking probably for the last maybe nine months. And what I love about it is that it's not, it doesn't sedate you, but it allows you to calm down and gets you into a right frame of mind for sleep. So um, we only have, I'm, I'm going to, I have to give you the pet, I have to give you the paddle because we only have 10 minutes left. And I feel like if we, yeah, good. Take one of those. Um, I feel like if we don't get into the fitness side again, we have a few more minutes for questions afterwards. We've got some great questions coming down. And um, with, with your book, I know we're going to have so much more information. We can have continue this discussion. So much information. To come. Um, but I do want to, is there any last points you want to throw out there, Bryce? I was just saying you nailed it. I mean, first of all, just so you know, 
this is open and uh, you know, yeah. it's almost done. So like, I'm clearly taking this myself. And again, you don't have to have an issue with attention, focus, alertness, concentration, or even mood or sleep. Yeah. But, but you know, there's nothing safer on the planet that I know of in context of what we're discussing and especially anxiety. It's non-stimulating, as you mentioned, not like caffeine or anything like that for the focus and alertness aspect, but it gets you into, and this is also what I talk about in my book, gets you into alpha wave. When we hear about meditation and mindfulness and breathing and relaxation, what are we trying to do? We're trying to instigate something called alpha wave activity, something an EEG, electroencephalogram, would pick up if we put tabs on our head. Mm -hmm. That wave is a meditative concentrating state. It's what Buddhist monks try to get into when they meditate. So you're able to focus better. So look, I'm not going to go on and on about just a single product. There are others, but you'll share that maybe with the group. There are others um, that I can put in this feed. Um, I'll post them. Of yeah, can you just drop it in the comments below there while we're doing that? Because someone's asking for the name of it. They, could, they couldn't see the picture, so that would yep. be great. Um, okay, thank you so much, Bryce. The information you have is incredible. We are so appreciative for that. Um, Brent, uh, fitness. How is fitness so important when it comes to mental health? Like, what are the positive ways? And how can we use it right now in terms of coping during these, these times of isolation? Yeah, well, well, first of all, I, I have to say thank you so much for, well, everybody on the panel, but, but uh, you know, Kevin and, and Peter, um, a lot of things I really relate to. My big issue with, you know, I know people who have experienced depression and are experiencing depression and, and the, the whole how do you approach it uh, has been a struggle for me. And the only way I know how is through fitness because it, it, it works. And, and uh, you know, I want to expand that. And, and so thank you guys for, for inspiring that within me. Um, you know, I've been in this industry for, as you said, 25 years and dating myself, but, uh, you know, I've seen the power of physical activity over and over and over again and what it does for people, not just physically, but obviously psychologically, mentally, uh, I mean, complete overhaul of, of personalities, of mood, of self, uh, you know, self image, everything. Uh, so it's, it's really amazing. And now, you know, we're in a stage with over, you know, 300 million plus people worldwide suffering from depression. We got you know, suicide rates skyrocketing, all these things, you know, people are feeling very discouraged with all the shutdowns and all of this. And I believe the number one drug that can help manage at least some of this is exercise. And it's something that's available to all of us. So, you know, my purpose is to share that uh, with everybody. And, and this pandemic has, uh, has scared the hell out of me uh, business wise too. And I, I like Bryce, I don't, I haven't suffered from depression, but uh, you know, I've come the closest over the last couple of years of just, you know, some, some real ups and downs, but I've always fallen back on what I feel is my purpose and, and it, it's helping through people through fitness. So uh, a few things, um, first of all, I'm going to spend like just a couple quick minutes. Let's get you guys just standing up. Cause you know, we got to do that with fitness. We got to get you standing up. So one of the things I want to say is fitness does not have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be super intense. It's just, it's just getting active, getting moving. So I have what I call, it's like a five minute circuit. We're not gonna do the full five minutes, obviously, but yeah, I know Miranda's ready to go. There's no pushups in this round, unfortunately, but it's, it's, you know, it's a, a way to be active. It's a, a mental active health um, circuit. So the first thing we do would be do a little bit of a drill running on the spot. We're going to skip that, but it's to get your heart rate up a little bit, get the circulation going. Cause when you get your circulation going, good things happen, which we'll talk about. Secondly, we're sitting a lot. So all our external rotators, our flexors are angry, they're shortened, and we're doing this. So the first thing I'm gonna get you to do is you're gonna hinge forward, if you can see me there, forward from the hip joint, okay? Keep your low back engaged. Get your hands up, thumbs up, so you're externally rotating the shoulders. And I want you to slowly squeeze your mid shoulder blades together as you exhale. Breathing's really important as well, guys. Extend forward and feel yourself squeeze the blades like you're, you're squeezing a walnut between your shoulder blades. And it should start to feel really good. You should start to feel some heat developing between those shoulders blade, shoulder blades. You're getting your shoulders, mid back, low back, everything in that posterior chain active, which is really important when it comes down to, uh, you know, alleviating some of those negative effects of sitting long periods of time. Okay, one more, and then I'll get into talking a little bit more. Um, next one, really good. So to get balance into your routine is, is really important. So uh, one thing I'm gonna get you to do, you're gonna stand on your left leg, okay? And if you need to hold on to something, that's totally okay. Knee partially bent. And again, we're gonna hinge forward and reach down. So kind of like a pendulum, your leg goes up, your upper body goes down. Keep that spine nice and straight. Come back up to the top, okay? So this requires a lot more of a connection between your brain and body, of course. 
your neuromuscular system has to really engage. You got to get more focused. There's coordination involved. But doing, you know, 10 reps on one side, 10 reps on the other side, you guys can sit down now, um, is, Oof, is a great way yeah. just to get yourself moving. Focus on that posture. Get that backside engaged. You know, focus on the posterior chain. Yeah, go ahead, Bryce. Sorry, I just have to say, so two key things that boost BDNF are exercise, just like you're pointing out, that brain drive neurotrophic factor, neuroplasticity, and mood, of course, and hot sauna. But exercise and so just getting heat up, getting heat up in your yeah. body boosts BDNF. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you can implement a circuit like that, one minute jogging on the spot, whatever your level is, and then you do 10 reps of your scapular retractions, 10 reps per side of that reach. And there you go, under five minutes, you've done something for yourself, for your body, for your brain, and for your mind. And if you do that, just, you know, incorporate, my advice to people is to incorporate that into uh, attach it to something you already do, a ritual you already do. So let's say when you brush your teeth in the morning or you get up an extra five minutes early, five minutes, you know, you have your cup of coffee before your cup of coffee, do this routine. So something to get you moving. And remember that, you know, exercise, of course, is going to release the endorphins, our feel good hormones, but the long-term effect, of course, getting your heart rate up, you know, stimulating your mind is going to have a bigger effect. On, and, and Bryce touched on this as well, but um, it's particularly cardiovascular exercise, actually, the research shows that, you know, you're not only elevating your endorphins, but more long term that um, exercise induced blood flow to certain centers of your brain are going to help you with things like mood, motivation and memory. Uh, so really important. And then, of course, brain talk already talked, uh, Bryce already talked about uh, BDNF uh, and the impact of increasing that with exercise, which is also key. Um, I know, Miranda, you, you have asked me before in the past about, you know, people are feeling stuck. Um, how do they get started? Uh, this is a big thing that I come across with a lot of people who are, you know, beginners to exercise or like more novice, or they've just taken, they've fallen off, you know, life took over and they've fallen off. So getting back in a couple of things, you know, make it an, an interest driven approach. So don't think that you have to go to a gym or you have to pop on a treadmill or a bike or things you hate to do just because they're, they're exercise. Um, start with interest. So determine what those are. Like, what are you interested in? Do you like going outside? If you like going outside, that's your starting point. You know, get out for a brisk walk for 10 minutes. You know, do a, a body weight workout outside, uh, ride your bike, whatever it is that's going to start at that point of interest because your likelihood of actually starting and maintaining something is far greater. And then what, what I struggle with is, you know, a lot of people, at, you, they can get started, but they don't, you know, the, the biggest thing is to get started. Right? That's the hardest thing, as we always know. Once you start, there's some momentum that can happen from there. And then you expose yourself to other things. You know, you, you take a boxing class. Next thing you know, you're excited about that. And so, you know, my point with that is an interest-driven approach. And I, I say look for something called, your, your, everybody has this, your think factor. And, and I wrote a book on this. And the whole idea behind it is that everybody has that internal spark. That's something that makes you tick, that you get amped about, you get excited about. And it's different for everybody. It can be something as simple as, you know, watching a, a movie that you're completely moved by and feel like you need to take action uh, or talking to a friend who shares some words to you that, that you feel so inspired uh, by or so moved by. So, moved by. so think about that um, and really write down what, what that might be for you. And then when it comes to activity, and then you have a starting point. And another thing I, I got to mention, because this is everybody, that you know you can't maintain motivation without inspiration so so motivation through inspiration is the way things go the inspiration happens that's the spark and then the flame occurs that's the motivation the flame dies always dies so know that the flame's going to die and look for inspiration continuously so with my clients and our programming i tend to have them on a quarterly system so every three months it's an automatic you know retest set some benchmarks you know, assess, you know, we talk it out. Where, where are you at now? What, what are your interests like? Take a seasonal approach. Then you can focus on maybe some seasonal sports. Um, the point being is like, know that, in, that inspiration has to be continually brought in uh, for anything in life in order for it to maintain motivation. Well, because we all hit those low points of motivation. Brent, the other right, day sorry. I accidentally hit on your uh, Instagram live and saw your move at noon and I had to drop down and do the push-up planks because I was so inspired <laughs> yeah. by your crazy strength. And so um, incredible advice. And I know, I think Pete and Kevin, I think you wanted to say something. I felt you're getting really excited, Pete, because you've been working out. I feel it. <laughs> so you can chime in as well. Yeah, I was just going to say for, for anyone out there listening to that, and I think, you know, Brent, you're, 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 you're 
process or thought around uh, inspiration was, was big. You know, I'd, I'd been 30 plus years as a gym rat, um, three, four days a week. And it was the social end of it. It was, you know, getting a good sweat for me. It was skiing every year. And so September I'd start to amp up my workouts and sometimes with or without a yep. trainer. Um, and yet, you know, because of what I went through and then because of COVID, I was a year and a half out of it. So I, I had hit a weight I'd never hit before. I was 25 pounds over my fighting weight. Um, and I, when my wife said she signed us up for a class, I, I don't do class. I don't do online. Uh, I've watched my daughters and my wife do videos. Uh, I just walked past. I think that's not my spot. Uh, it's in the gym with, with my peeps. But man, it, I, I'm, I can't believe how happy I am that I did it. You know, one of the things is, is, and I know you're doing this online, is there's suddenly an interaction with someone, you know, which felt outside of my home. It felt really good. There was a challenge. They worked with me and yeah, I wanted to be sick the first three days and I couldn't walk the first five, but um, stairs were, you know, stairs looked like uh, hell to me. Um, but, you know, man, it, it is amazing. You know, you give it a bit of time, you use that inspiration, you work with someone like you online and, you know, from, from a doubter uh, to you know, a, a complete believer, I say, amen, brother. And it's been good for me. Right. Thank you. Th thank you for sharing that because that's, that's another big point that I want to make is that, you know, if I can say anything uh, to anyone who's, who's struggling on, you know, with depression, but also just getting started in, in fitness, hire a coach, you know, hire a coach or, or start a, uh, you know, a virtual group class or, or even a, one of these boot camps, you know, do your research, but everybody needs a coach in different areas of your life. Everyone, and, and everyone needs a coach. Everyone does. Right. So you have the accountability there. Yes. You know, you have the expertise. You have somebody or, you know, whether it's virtually or in person, now you have a source of inspiration and motivation and you're part of something. You know, we need purpose. We need to be part of something to be mentally healthy. Um, so now you have a connection with somebody that, you know, you, you can also share things with during the journey through fitness, bring a friend in on it. And, you know, we're, we're built to move and be social beings. So you need to look for things that combine those two. And, and I think, Hiring a great coach is, is, a, is a great first step, even if it's just to start things off. Because remember, we talked about that spark. You know, that coach or that virtual class or whatever it is could be your spark. And then it's just a matter of looking for, you know, adding new things as you go along. Oh, we got red flags for everybody right, guys. in the house. Okay, I have to say, th this conversation can go on forever. And I know, Kevin, you want to say something, Bryce, too. But uh, there's questions below. And we have, like, maybe... Uh, 10, 15 more minutes to answer them. So we're going to get to things, but I want to, I want to focus in for those who have to leave because originally we said it's an hour session for those who have to leave. I want to let you know that um, nature's Emporium is going to be matching the sales of uh, the um, promotion of Neil brothers logger. Uh, this is incredible, Peter. I don't know if you want to talk a bit about this, but all proceeds go to support uh, mental health programs and initiatives. And so we are matching that donation. Um, also, um, we are going to be randomly selecting 20 winners from the list of attendees for a $25 gift card, and that will be emailed to you. So that's exciting too. And for those asking, the webinar is going to be made available post event and we post on YouTube. So don't worry, you can share it. We love you sharing it. Um, so we can go back to the fitness for a few minutes. And then I really want to get to some of these great questions, if that's okay with uh, you, you awesome men on this panel. <laughs> Okay. Can I just, yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Brent. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just, I was just going to say, because, you know, I know people are stuck and I know people have a problem getting started and, and I want people to put this in their mind that you got to start small, start small, whether it's 10 minutes, you know, like, like the thing that I just did, the, the workout that I just did, um, you know, five, 10 minutes of activity, a few days a week, it's going to create momentum by doing it. You know, you will feel a benefit uh, as you go forward and don't worry about the intensity. Don't worry about the focus. Don't worry about the amount of time. Remember that it's part of the process of developing a habit for regular exercise. And that's going to help you mentally long-term. Amazing. I love that. Awesome advice, Bryce. Yep. Uh, I, I just have to say this because everyone knows me as like the, you know, the, the diet lifestyle, especially supplement kind of guru. If I could put exercise into a pill, and have you swallow mm. it once a day, it would cure 80% of what ails us in North America. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm including mental health issues in that because here's the deal. The real underlying pandemic is diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Those are the, no, co there's no comorbidity here. Those are the underlying issues as to what we're facing right now. 
and 30 minutes every day. And I don't take excuses. I, you know, I might not even be, you know, as forgiving as Brent is right now. All you need is this time. Yes, because that's where you have to start. But I promise you something. Mm. Like I, I alluded to earlier, I'll just end off by saying this. I don't personally have issues as I can define them with mental health. But if I don't get my hour of exercise in every day, especially after two days under circumstances that I just can't do it, I'm a disaster. I do not have a good yeah. mood. I can't <laughs> think. I can't. I can't. I, I don't know what I would do without exercise. And, and, but that does start with simplicity as Brent alluded to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll just, I'll just put it out there for those that are in need of a community and, and Miranda alluded to this earlier. Um, and you want to get into something I have a 25 minute workout every Wednesday at 12 Eastern standard time, 25 minutes, all levels watch for modifications. Um, you know, I welcome everybody to come in there. It's a great starting point and, it, and it's a fun community. Um, on my Instagram live. So you'd have to go to my Instagram at I am Bishop. Thank you for that. Um, Kevin, I feel like you need, you want to chime in on something there too. Oh, no, I just, I, I, I just wanted to sort of, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about something after, after, right after Brent too, um, because I want to leave people with something they can do. I want to give people a, a takeaway. So just before I do that, I, I just, you know, so, uh, just a quick thought. We have about 6,000 thoughts every day. Studies have shown that out of those 6,000 thoughts, 85% are negative thoughts. Out of all of our thoughts a day, 85% are negative. Out of those 85% of negative thoughts, and this, is, this was done, I believe, by Cornell University. Um, out of those, 95% of the, the negative uh, you know, worries never happen. So in other words, we spend most of our day in negativity. Whatever you can do to bring yourself into positivity and bring yourself into the, and wait for it, bring yourself into the moment, you will be doing a world of good. Alan Watts uh, had once said that the past and the future are constructs. They don't exist. They never will exist. The present is the only thing that is, exists, that we have control over, is the present. Our pre if, if you're saying, you know, you want to wait till tomorrow, well, you know what? Tomorrow is never, ever going to come because it will be the present. So you have to put yourself in the moment. And one way you put yourself in the moment, and you hear so much about breathing, we've talked about it tonight, there are classes on it, is it brings you into the moment and it also does something sneaky to your body. The, the autonomic nervous system is basically our autopilot. It's what's responsible for us, everything that happens during the day, our breathing, um, our eyes blinking, uh, uh, you know, anything, going to the bathroom, anything, anything like that that makes us, gives us the urges to move things through. That's the autonomic, uh, autonomic uh, nervous system. So in that system, we have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system and these go back to, to primal man. The sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight system. That's, that's what alerts us that there's a saber toothed tiger outside the cave and it's waiting for us. So what it does is it takes blood away from all parts of the body and puts it to the muscles so that if you have to, you can run or you can fight. It closes off the stomach, it closes off the bowels, it tries to clear the bowels. And so that's your sympathetic nervous system. When the danger passes, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in. Think of it as the gas pedal and the brake pedal. So the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and it says, okay, everybody, blood, go back to where you're supposed to be. Uh, heart rate, I need you to go down. Pulse rate, I need you to go down. Okay, well, our mind does not understand this modern fancy society. What we see as anxiety and stress is constant, but it's not a saber toothed tiger out there. It's constructs in a lot of cases of what might happen tomorrow, what, what happened yesterday. So we have to bring ourselves into the moment. And when we bring ourselves into the moment, guess what? We are taking control of our parasympathetic nervous system because we're forcing it to slow the heart rate down, slow the pulse down. And one of the best ways is breathing. So I want to give everyone, this is something you can do any time of the day. Do it when you're stressed, do it when you're not stressed, but especially when you're stressed, stressed and you're feeling anxiety, you do something that's called box breathing. And what you're going to do 
is you're going to breathe in through your nose. And as you breathe in through your nose, you're going to do it for four seconds. You're going to, you're going to realize just how fresh and clean that air is. And you're going to feel it cool coming in through your nose and into your lungs. Then you're going to hold it. Now, it's important that you hold it for four seconds because you're telling the parasympathetic nervous system, I'm taking over here. Okay, so do you want to just sit this one out? I need to slow the heart rate down. Okay, fair, fair enough. Then you're going to let it out through your mouth for four seconds. And as you do, you're going to imagine that you're picking up little pieces of the stress and anxiety inside your body and you're letting it out through your mouth and you're going to hold it for another four seconds for the same reason. So we're all going to try that right now. Uh, we're going to try box breathing. All right. So remember, it's four, 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 and four in through your nose, hold it out through your mouth, hold it. Okay. So we're going to try it for about a minute. All right. So I think we have about 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Well, let's, do seconds, okay? Let's, do, <laughs> let's do one. Okay. Let's do one. Let's do one then, just so okay. you get the idea. So in through your nose and count one, two, three, four. You're going to hold it now for three, four. And out through your mouth, letting some of the anxiety and the stress go. One, two, three, four. And then you're going to hold it. One, two, three, four. And you're going to repeat this for two or three minutes. And you're going to do it several times a day. I guarantee you, you will feel better afterwards. I love this.